Okay, so in the last segment of this lecture, I'd like to get back to this discussion we were looking at here when we were talking about the variance of a function versus its sort of local variance or the quadratic form. And one thing that we said was that the um, given a graph G, whether or not the standard random walk from an arbitrary starting point mixes quickly, in other words, it quickly gets to the stationary distribution, is determined by whether or not this uh, quadratic form of the graph F is never small. Now, we have to get into quantitative things now because uh, we need to understand how small can it be. And uh, for the question of how small can it be, actually there's a bit of a trivial answer. The smallest it can be is zero. So we'll talk about that for a moment. We're also gonna talk later about how large it can be and there we'll need to um, take scaling considerations into account. But always you should be comparing this uh, sort of local variance the quadratic form of f with the sort of global variance, the regular variance of f when you just choose a uniformly random, sorry, when you choose a, a vertex u from the stationary distribution and look at the variance of the random variable f of u. Okay, so let's get at this question first of how small can the uh, quadratic form be? So we'll ask how small can this be? And as you know, I said, there's a rather trivial answer to this question. It's a non-negative quantity and it can be zero. So of course the answer is zero. But the question is, when is it zero? So um, well, one obvious case when it's zero is if the function itself is zero. If f is constantly zero, then the quadratic form is also zero. But let's ask ourselves, is there a non-trivial uh, f that makes the quadratic form zero. You know, can there be some uh, non-trivial such f? Maybe it depends a little bit on what you mean uh, by non-trivial, but the answer is potentially yes. So uh, here's another function which makes the quadratic form zero, the constantly one function. Okay, so here is the answer yes, at least if you count this as non-trivial. If f is constantly one, then the quadratic form of f is zero. And uh, well, let me just remind you why that is. The quadratic form of f, I'll just repeat the definition here, it's a half times the expectation over a random edge uv of f of u minus f of v squared. Okay, and so you see if f is always equal to one, then uh, this difference is always zero, and therefore uh, the expected square of the difference is also zero. And indeed, if f takes on any particular value constantly, if f labels every single vertex by the same value, then the quadratic form value, this e of f, script e of f, will be zero. Okay. Actually, as we saw before, one of the properties of this uh, quadratic form, the script e of f, is that if you add a scalar to every value of f, it doesn't change the value of uh, the quadratic form. So in fact, even once we knew that uh, the quadratic form is zero, um, when f is constantly zero, then we learn that it's uh, zero for all f uh, that are constant. Okay, so perhaps you might think, all right, well, these are all the ways in which the quadratic form of f could be zero, but that's not necessarily the case either. So let's think about carefully when this quantity might be zero. So let's imagine drawing our graph, surrounded by uh, my graph G, and um, let's say we have some vertex here, and uh, let's put another vertex here. And let's say f has some value at this vertex here, one. Okay, it could be anything, but maybe by adding a constant to f, we can make it equal one. All right, that's fine. Now, if uh, f has an edge here, let's call this uh, u1 and call this u2. Well, you see that if the quadratic form of f is going to equal zero, then uv must also get the label uh, one under f, okay? Because there's a chance when we draw a random edge uv that we choose this specific edge between u1 and u2. And then if the overall expected square of the difference is gonna be zero, well, f had better have the same value here as it has here. And now we can kind of continue with this reasoning, right? If there's some other uh, vertex out here, u3, and it's connected to u1, then f must also give it the value one if the quadratic form uh, of f is gonna be zero because there's some chance that this will be the edge chosen in the random experiment, choosing a random edge. 
And so I better have the same values on the, the two endpoints of this edge. Okay, and similarly, every uh, edge here must have its um, endpoints labeled by the same value. So we can kind of conclude that S value must be one everywhere. So it looks like I'm telling you that actually it is the case that as soon as you assume that like one value of the function f, let's say u1 is one, then all the values of the function f must also be one if the quadratic form is gonna have value zero. But not so because f might have more, or sorry, g might have more than one connected component. So g might have another connected component. This is possible. And um, maybe f gives this vertex and this connected component the value five. And this is not going to uh, be inconsistent with the quadratic form having value zero. It is true that all the other vertices in this connected component must also be labeled five by f. Because all the edges here have a chance of showing up in this experiment and therefore f has to give the same values to the endpoints. But they could all have different values. Uh, the connected components could have different values. Okay, so if G has three connected components like this, um, you know, then um, each connected component could have a different labeling according to F. Maybe this is minus 3.2, minus 3.2 on all vertices. And such an F that's one constantly here and five constantly here and minus 3.2 constantly here will have the property that, um, you know, when you pick any edge, the endpoint difference will be zero, and so the quadratic form is zero. So what have we sort of concluded by this discussion? I'll write it as a proposition. So given a graph G, um, the quadratic form of a function F is zero, if and only if F is constant on each connected component of G. And in fact, there's an addendum to this statement, which is going to uh, get us yet further into linear algebra, which is that actually, the number of connected components of G is equal to the number of linearly independent functions f um, that have uh, the quadratic form equal to zero. Okay, so we know all the functions that have quadratic form equal to zero are the ones that are um, constant on each connected component. And we also know that we can think of functions as vectors in Rn, where n is the number of vertices. And so there's a notion of vectors or functions being linearly dependent or independent. And it turns out that if you look at the number of, um, or the maximum number of linearly independent Fs you can get that have quadratic form equal to zero, this is equal to the number of connected components of G. And in particular, um, you know, if the connected components, I'll just write components for brevity, are, let's say, S1 through SL. Well, one thing you can uh, note is that the functions indicator of S1, indicator of S2, dot, 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 indicator of SL, are indeed linearly independent. You might not be too th used to thinking about um, functions in a vector space rather than vectors, but you can see like, okay, let's say uh, we have a vector representing a function and the coordinates corresponding to the set S1 are these up here. So the indicator of that set looks like this vector and maybe the, um, the second, maybe there are two connected components and S2 is the second connected component and its coordinates are the ones down here. So uh, the indicator of that would look like this vector. And you see that indeed these are linearly independent vectors, meaning there's no way to take a linear combination of them that gives the all zeros vector, unless you take the all zeros linear combination. And that's just because, I mean, they have disjoint supports. So in general, I mean, if you have more than two connected components, all the ones will be in disjoint places, and there's no way to take a linear combination of zero one vectors, where the ones are all in distinct locations, uh, to get the all zeros vector, unless you take the all zeros linear combinations. 
And in general, the set of all f's, uh, I should say that all f's such that this quadratic form of f equals zero is equal to like all the things that look like um, sum i goes from one to l, this is sort of sloppy notation, but uh, c i times the indicator of s uh, i. Okay, so um, really the set of all functions that have um, quadratic form zero is the set of all functions which are constant on each connected component, or it's all linear combinations of these indicators of the connected components. And this is actually really, um, there's two nice things to say about this. One, this is really the first connection we'll see between um, kind of a combinatorial graph theoretic property, namely number of connected components, and a linear algebra concept, you know, you know, the number of linearly independent vectors or functions that have a certain quadratic form. Okay, so really this is what spectral graph theory is all about, like um, finding relationships on one hand between nice combinatorial properties of graphs that are about their geometry and things that we care about, and um, linear algebraic properties of the quadratic form and the adjacency matrix and uh, things like that. I'd also like to say that this is a very basic proposition that um, the uh, quadratic form of, uh, sorry, that um, the number of linearly independent f that have quadratic form zero, call it k, is equal to the number of connected components, k of g. Um, there's a sort of robustification of this fact, which is very interesting, and we'll um, look at it in some sense later. Um, which says that if G has K mostly disconnected components, or if G's vertices can be partitioned into K clusters such that there are very few edges going between the clusters, this holds um, if and only if you can find K linearly independent functions where the quadratic form E of F is small. So again, I have to put all these things in quotes because there's precise quantitative uh, aspects to it, which we'll not get into yet. Um, but it's a very interesting and non-trivial robustification of this concept. So the number of connected components is the number of linearly independent functions with quadratic form exactly zero. And this idea is at the heart of, say, um, some very, uh, the best known approximation algorithms for the sparsest cut problem in um, optimization and algorithm theory. Okay, so that's what I want to say about the topic of minimizing the quadratic form of f over all possible f. The minimum possible value is zero, and we can say some interesting things about functions that make it zero. Now let's talk about the uh, other side of the spectrum, which is the question of, I'll just write it like this, what about maximizing um, script f, script e of f, maximizing the quadratic form um, over all functions f. So we're fixing a graph and now asking, well, how big can this quadratic form e of f be? Now there's a, obvious problem with asking this question as it is, you need some kind of scaling considerations because if you take some function f, has some quadratic form value, e of f is um, five, and then you multiply f by two, then the quadratic form value goes up by two squared, which is four, so it would go up to 20. And you can just multiply f by a large constant and make the quadratic form value as large as you want. Okay, so just recall um, this sort of scaling fact that the quadratic form of cf is equal to c squared times the quadratic form uh, applied to f. Okay, so um, what this means is, you know, the right way to ask this question is to fix some scaling of f and then ask what's the, among such uh, fixed, uh, scaling fixed versions of f, which one has the largest value of the quadratic form? And really, as I alluded to earlier, if we go back here, the most natural scaling is to not just look at all f's, but to look at all f's whose global variance is equal to some fixed value, and our favorite value for variance is, is one. Okay, so the right way to ask this question is to look over all, um, given a graph, look over all functions f whose global variance is one, and now let's ask how large their local variance or quadratic form value can be. Okay, so the right way to ask this question is to look at what is the maximum possible value quadratic form of a function f subject to the variance of f. Uh, remember, this is the variance of the random variable f of u when u is drawn from the stationary distribution is equal to 1. Okay, 
And uh, one quick thing to say is that we could have equivalently written less than or equal to one here. Because, um, you know, if I let you have a variance that's less than one, that doesn't really help you if you're trying to maximize the quadratic form. Or in particular, like if you found some quadratic form value and your variance was um, a quarter, then what you should do is like just double your function and that makes the variance one, which is still allowed, and that will also make four times the quadratic form value. Okay, so you should always, if you haven't done it yet, scale your function by a constant to make its variance as large as allowed, namely one, and this will only improve your quadratic form value. Okay, so this is the question that we're interested in now, maximizing the quadratic form among all functions whose variance is at uh, most one. Now, before we talk about that, I would like to um, say that sometimes we do another similar looking thing, which is um, maybe maximize the quadratic form E of F subject to um, the expected square of F being one. Remember this, we wrote like this, the inner product of F with itself or the expected value of f of uh, random u squared equals one. Okay, and this may uh, look like a slightly different question, but as I'll argue to you in a moment, it's actually the exact same question. First, let me make the ob obvious observation that again, uh, for this second question, I mean, forget about the first question for a second, but for the second question, we can also equivalently write less than or equal to one here, because again, if you're trying to maximize e of f, you may as well, um, you know, scale up your function as much as you can. So if you have a, a expected f squared that's at most one, just scale it up until its expectation of f squared equals one. Okay, so uh, these two things are equivalent. These two things are equivalent. And what I want to tell you now is actually these two problems are also equivalent. Okay, and uh, let me quickly justify that for you. Of course, we know that um, the variance of f is equal to the expected value of f squared minus the expected value of f squared. It's all with respect to um, actually a random vertex u from the stationary distribution. Um, or just uh, inverting this, the expected value of f squared is equal to the variance of f plus the uh, mean of f squared. Okay, so the expected value of f squared is always at least as big as the variance of f. Um, Okay, so in particular, that means if you can achieve some quadratic form value with uh, an f whose variance is one, then you can achieve the same quadratic form value um, with the same f, and that f will have expected f squared at most one. So any valid solution to this maximization problem is always a valid solution to this maximization problem. Um, and therefore, this maximization problem's value is always less than or equal to the one where you're maximizing over expected value of f squared is at most one. But the converse is also true, and let's see why. Let's say you have some function f, and its expected value of f squared is at most one, and it achieves some quadratic form value, e of f. What I like to say is you can also achieve that same quadratic form value with a function f whose variance is at most one. And that's not immediately obvious because the variance in general is, um, wait, I think I've done this the wrong way around. Uh, yeah, perhaps I've described this the wrong way around, but what I mean to, let me, let me try again. Let's say you've achieved some quadratic form value, uh, E of F, um, with a function whose variance is, let's say, even exactly one. And you're wondering if you can also achieve the same quadratic form value with a function whose expected square is also one. And you might be worried because the expected square of F is always bigger than the variance. So now you might think, uh-oh, maybe the expected uh, square of F is bigger than one. So it's not allowed as a solution here. But uh, remember that if you add or subtract a constant to a function, then it doesn't change the quadratic form E of F, okay? The quadratic form is invariant to translation. And the variance is also invariant to translation. So if you add or subtract a constant to F, it doesn't change its variance. So if you have some function F achieving, let's say variance one or at most one and achieving some quadratic form value, you can add or subtract a constant to it and it won't change anything. We'll still have variance one or at most one in the same quadratic form but you can potentially make the um, expected square of f smaller. And indeed, what you should just do is translate it by subtracting its mean, the first typical step in standardization, um, to get it down to a function whose mean is zero. And when you get down to a function whose mean is zero, um, it doesn't change the variance or the quadratic form, but this term here will become zero, and you will have made the expected value of f squared equal to the variance of f. 
And so if the variance of f was bounded by one, then so is the expected value of f squared now. So it's legal for the second optimization problem and you've achieved the same quadratic form value. Okay, so sorry for getting that a little bit backwards, but I hope I've convinced you now that these two quadratic um, programs, if you will, these two tasks of maximizing the quadratic form E of F with respect to either a variance bound or a second moment bound are actually the same task. Okay, so sometimes we like to think of it one way, sometimes the other way. Okay, so now let's finally actually think about it. Um, let's say we fix uh, the expected square of the function to be at most one or equal to one. And we want to find a function F whose uh, quadratic form is as large as possible. Okay, so how can we do this? Well, if you recall again, the, the formula for the quadratic form, which is here, we're not trying to make this large. So we fix some scaling thing, which fixes something about the global distribution of F's values. And we're trying to make this quadratic form as large as we can. So intuitively, we want to assign a real number to each vertex so that um, the endpoint differences along edges are, is as large as possible. Okay, or if you think of um, a function as mapping a vertex into a point on the real line, we kind of want to embed the vertices into the real line so that edges, endpoints, are as far apart as possible. Let me just write that intuition down again. So the intuition for maximizing the quadratic form is uh, we want to embed the vertices into the real line. This will be f, uh, so that edge endpoints are as far apart as possible. And if you think about this, um, there's one kind of graph where you're going to be extremely successful at this task. So let me ask this as a little question. Um, for what kind of g? will you be most successful in embedding the graph into the line uh, such that the edges get sort of stretched as much as possible? So G will you be most successful. And I hope by the time I finish writing this, you'll have thought of the answer. The answer is seemingly bipartite graphs. Because for a bipartite graph, there's a natural thing you can do which is to, let's say, give all the vertices on the left part of the vertex set the value um, one, and all the vertices on the right side of the vertex set, um, let's say, minus one. Okay, so again, on the topic of um, you know, maximizing the quadratic form of f, subject to the scaling condition that, um, let's say, the expected value of f squared is at most 1. If g is a bipartite graph, and its vertex set is uh, got this bipartite bipartition, v1, v2, then let's consider this f. Let f be the indicator of uh, vertex set 1 minus the indicator of vertex set 2. Or in other words, um, f of a vertex u is plus one if u is in the first vertex part and minus one if u is in the second vertex part. Okay, so let's first check that this um, function f satisfies the you know, scaling condition. And that's easy because the expected value of f of u squared is well, it's one because f squared is always one. Its values are plus or minus one, so that's great. Its uh, expected value of f squared is equal to one. That's nice. Now, what about the quadratic form of this f? Well, if you think about it for a moment, you'll see that the quadratic form value for this f is two. And why is that? Well, remember, the quadratic form is a half, expectation over a random edge uv of f of u minus f of v squared. And if you have a bipartite graph and we draw a random edge uv, uh, u is always on one side, v is always on the other side. So uh, one of these will be plus or minus one. The other one will be the opposite, minus plus or minus plus one. Uh, and the difference will be plus or minus two. The square of the difference will be four. So the full expectation will be four, and then we multiply by a half, we get two. 
Okay, so that's a, a modest calculation. And so we see that subject to this scaling condition, uh, if the graph is bipartite, we can achieve a quadratic form value of two. And it's maybe reasonable to think intuitively that this might be the best thing you can do for any graph. And that's the case. So in some sense, this will be the, the last thing I want to mention today. Uh, here's a proposition. For any graph, bipartite or not, um, quadratic form applied to any function f is always at most two times the squared two norm of f, okay, which recall is two times the expected value of f squared. Okay, so I'll prove this to you. And that's great because, you know, under our scaling condition that we make that this is at one or at most one, it shows that no matter the graph, bipartite or not, uh, the largest quadratic form value you can have is two. So let's prove this. Um, it's a straightforward proof with one uh, little trick in it. So this quantity, as we know, is a half expectation over a random edge, f of u minus f of v squared. Okay, and we're just going to expand it out. So we get a uh, half times, and we'll use linear area of expectation too at the same time. So we get expected value of or just u. So really, uh, let me write it a bit more slowly. Uh, this will be the first quantity we get when we square things out and uh, use linear of expectation, the expected value over a randomly chosen edge uv of just f of u squared. Now remember, um, if you draw a random edge uv and then just remember only u, which is all you need to do to compute this f of u squared, the distribution of u alone is precisely pi, the invariant distribution. And that was uh, exactly how we defined the invariant distribution, in fact. Okay, so what I want to say here is that we may as well just write here u drawn from pi, because we don't need to know v in order to compute the, the thing inside the expectation. Okay, similarly, let me do the, the part you get when you uh, look at f of v squared. It'll be very similar. You'll get a half times the expectation, again, over a random edge uv of f of v squared. And again, this quantity in the middle only depends on v, so what we're really doing here is choosing a random edge uv and then forgetting about u. As we argued before, this is again um, just a fancy way to choose v from the stationary distribution or the invariant distribution pi. So we can again say this is just v drawn from pi. Okay, so we have uh, two copies of a half expected value of f squared. That's nice. Okay, and we have the cross term. So let's handle the cross term here. We get minus, well, we have this factor of a half here, but um, we're also gonna get a two from the cross term. So those will cancel out. And so we'll get a minus expected value over a random edge uv of f of u, f of v. Okay, and actually unlike in the case, we did this calculation a little bit before when we were talking about the global variance, there u and v were independent uh, vertices drawn from pi. They weren't drawn according to an edge. Um, unlike in that case, where we had independence between u and v, we can't just say, oh, the expectation of a product is equal to the product of the expectation, because f of u and f of v are definitely not independent random variables, because u and v are drawn uh, as a random edge. Now, here's a general life tip that I mentioned uh, perhaps before. Um, whenever you have an expectation of a product of random variables, and they're not independent, and you don't know what to do, Use Cauchy-Schwarz, and that will at least break them up into something that only depends on the first random variable and something that only depends on the second random variable, and hopefully that will be good enough. So let's do that. Cauchy-Schwarz actually tells us that the um, absolute value of this expectation can be bounded by sort of the two norm of the random variable f of u times the two norm of the random variable f of v. Okay, and therefore uh, we're subtracting this quantity, but we can instead uh, uh, to get an upper bound, we can add this uh, upper bound from Cauchy-Schwarz. So we're going to use Cauchy-Schwarz here. And uh, let's first tidy up the first term. Of course, uh, these two terms here are identical, even though they use different letters, u and v. So here we have expected value of f squared. Half plus a half is one. And by Cauchy-Schwarz, the second term can be bounded by plus... Um, the square root of expected value of f of u squared. 
times the expected value of f of v squared. Okay, and remember, again, here the expectation is really over a random edge, u and v. But as we argued before, you know, this only depends on uh, u, this only depends on v. So we can just forget about uh, v for the first expectation and u in the second expectation. And then these random variables, uh, u and v, are both distributed according to pi. So this thing inside the square root is again expected value of f squared. And this thing inside the square root is again expected value of f squared. We've got the square root of this multiplied against itself. So we just get, finally, another copy of expected value of f squared. Okay, and so finally, this equals 2 times expected value of f squared. And perhaps I can fit it all on one screen. There you have it. We have an upper bound for any f on uh, the quadratic form, script E of f. Then uh, uh, the bound is 2 times the 2 norm square root of f. Okay, great. So that concludes that proof. And let me just end with a few comments on it. Um, first, let me just write here. First, um, as an exercise for you, I'll let you show that uh, equality of E F equaling two times the square two norm of F is possible, well, we know it's possible if g is bipartite. We saw that with uh, the function f that puts one on um, one part of the vertices and minus one on the other part of the vertices. But this is an if and only if. Uh, okay, so the only way you can get uh, this quadratic form to equal twice the two norm, or the only way you can get it to equal to two under our scaling conditions is if f is, sorry, if g is bipartite. So that's not a very hard um, exercise. And lastly, now let me talk briefly about um, a robustification of this fact. See, again, we have a fact about sort of the combinatorial nature of G, bipartiteness, relating towards these more algebraic or linear algebraic quantities like uh, the quadratic form and the two norm and so forth. So the robustification of this fact is also very interesting. Um, it says that um, equality is almost possible if and only if G is close to being a bipartite graph. Again, as always, there's quantitative aspects. I should put those in quotes. But if you have a graph G, then it's possible um, uh, to get um, a function F with variance or two norm at most one, whose quadratic form is close to two, like two minus epsilon, if and only if G is in some sense almost bipartite or if it has an almost perfect maximum cut. Okay, and so this connection between um, this quadratic form and two norms and max cut algorithms is also very interesting. And in fact, to really exploit this connection and understand the relationships here and understand the quadratic form, what you really need to look at is another classic uh, topic in linear algebra, namely eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So that'll be the topic in the next lecture, eigenvectors and eigenvalues of graphs.